know, so like when we breathe, like profoundly in, like inhale, you, you kind of like raise your chest, your rib cage expands. When you exhale, that collapses, which is like easy to do when your muscles are, when your arms are low because those intracostal muscles relax. But when you don't have the freedom to move your arms as you wish because somebody pinned them high, like with nails onto a, a, a cross, all you can do is the next best thing, which is to press down in the nail in your feet. Pull and twist on nails that are going through the metacarpals where there's the ulnar nerve and the median nerve that pass there. And, and, and you have to twist. Like we have a bifurcation pattern in the, in the wrist that means that he's, he's not just staying still and just like rising straight up, but a square cross section of this nail is now grating against mm. that. Area. We have in World War II, there were soldiers that didn't have morphine when their median nerve was exposed and preferred to commit suicide than, than to endure this pain. And, and Christ is there for, what, four and a half hours breathing in this way? And we know this because all the blood that's trickled down the forearm is like, uh, likewise um, dividing again and again. Mm. He's, it seems he's in an inferior position, and he's in uh, uh, then a higher position, up and down, up and down, and this just to breathe. For me, the, the point that really is driven home is, the words then that he speaks. It's like, if that's what it takes to, to utter a breath, like just to get a air out, mm. what is it to pray? And I mean, it just gives a whole new insight into the heart of Christ, the love of Christ, what drives him, that he should be speaking to his father in this way. Father, and, and I love this little detail. Uh, in the Greek, it says, he was saying, Father, forgive them. Not, not he said mm. a, in like a one-time thing, but... Maybe that was a refrain that he came back to again and again, Father, forgive them. Oh yeah, Beatitudes Earth. Welcome to the Beatitudes, everybody. We're coming at you from every continent on the globe. That's right. The Beatitudes. <laughs> this is a show for Christian men who are seeking to grow in their walk with the Lord in this crazy modern world, but doing it together, locked arm in arm with their brothers in authentic fraternity and never forgetting the joy of the gospel that comes through humorness and holiness. Two very important words <laughs> from the catechism. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what chapter that is, but <laughs> my name is Jeff Shufflebein. I am so proud to be here with my co-host, Nicholas Besner. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> Everything is going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Paul Colker. Hello, world. Hello, world. Hey, this is going to be, speaking of world, our first guest to ever jump on a plane to come here from Rome. Yes. Yeah. I think when after the show got booked, maybe he ended up giving some lectures at the University of Dallas yeah. last night. Yeah, but we were the priority, <laughs> I think. Uh, no, but we wanted to say, since you're coming from Rome, vorremo dirti benvenuto al Beatitudes. Oh, wow, grazie. <laughs> Li Beatitudini? <laughs> That's good. Oh, okay, the there we are. Mi piace studare italiano Per divertimento? Oh, wow. oh look at you. Ah, you had no idea. <laughs> I didn't know. No, hablo italiano. <laughs> Does anybody know what they just said? No. Nah. I don't. We'll go. <laughs> I, when I, you don't know this. When I was 23, I was kind of miserable, and I was like, what's a cool career? And I was like, I'll go be an Italian lawyer. So <laughs> <laughs> I went to SMU's continuing education program yeah. instead of taking Italian. That was hard. <laughs> it's an adjustment. Yeah. <laughs> you started to. Ma non è così difficile. Wow, you got a good accent. Oh, actually. thanks. Yeah, you really do. <laughs> I don't know if you're faking it, but you're, it's working. No, no. I, <laughs> so I, I lived there actually. For, oh, okay. I studied uh, I studied in seminary for a little bit ah. over there. So when I heard you were coming from Rome, I was like, all right, let's try to make him feel at home. Wow, the yeah. hearts are being revealed right here. <laughs> yeah, that's many, it. Many, many. <laughs> I tried to say beatitudes in Italian and came up beatitudes. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, it sounds I, right. I actually don't know how to say dude. In a, I think they say, do you know what they say? Uh, oh, it's kind of so. demeaning. Um, like, like fat boy is yeah, like a fat boy. <laughs> yeah, it, like you got to work that in. Oh, maybe you could. Like, how do you say it in uh, in Greek? It's makarios, right? So That's get, what I was gonna. Yeah, guess. You, you, so, <laughs> a, a macarism is a, is a beatitude in Greek. There so that you, you could be like in Greece, you'd be like Mac Daddy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you'd be. You got you have to work in some clever pun. All our fans from the '90s just knew what was going That's on. That's exactly <laughs> right. I I am from the '90s. What are you talking? Yeah. Same. Yep. Same. Yep. So this is really critical. Let's introduce our guest from the '90s uh, and from Rome, and 
just a blessing to have you here, Father Andrew hey, Dalton. Thanks. Oh my goodness, I Woo. can't believe you're here. Like we've yeah. all watched your work, and now you're sitting at the tiny table with three other dudes. <laughs> yes. No. Or, this this is a table of greatness, small as it might be. This <laughs> is. I, I'm I'm really super excited to be here. I listened to your. I, I can't say it very much yet because I just got introduced to you guys. Yeah. But I love it. I will, can't get enough of it. I I want I want to tell everybody about it. I'm serious. Awesome. Thank I, you. I think that it's the kind of thing that my friends would listen to and uh, I, that I listen to and enjoy. So way to go. Wow. Thank you. I'm done with the show. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to clip that part and play that on repeat. You're cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you, really. Yeah, so listen, uh, we got introduced to you through one of your brother legionary priests here in town. And it was at that point that we all started kind of binge watching and binge listening to the work that you've been doing specifically around the Shroud of Turin. Yeah. And I think that story is just such a an eye-opener. There are so many people that I know will be listening to this that will say, rewind, what words did Jeff just say? And there's other people who say, oh, I know what the Shroud of Turin is, but they've never gone deep. And so I think we're appealing to an audience that covers this entire huge base. But how does one become an expert on the Shroud of Turin? Yeah. Do you know, I was just in adoration here this morning, and I was thinking about that. What, what a weird story. What in the heck am I doing here? <laughs> like, Lord, what have you done? Because, you know, there's some things in life which we plan and program, orchestrate, and execute, and that's not how this happened. Wow. The, this was absolutely God's thing. Um, but I was in Rome studying theology, and um, somebody invited me, a priest friend of mine. He said, you got to go hear Emanuela Marinelli. She has some 22-plus books on the Shroud. Wow. She's been doing this for, for decades, and you got to see this woman. She is a powerhouse of energy and enthusiasm for, for God, for the things of the church. And, and she studied up on the Shroud in such a way that now she delivers. Man, you cannot keep up with this woman. It's like, sit down and— Hang on for the ride. So <laughs> I, wow. I, I I went. I said, look, I'll stay for 45 minutes, and I'll probably sneak out because I've got I've got homework to do. But I was just glued to my chair. It was it was so exciting. Mm. I I went home. I remember walking back to the seminary that night, thinking, I, I, why am I 10 years in seminary and never heard this stuff? Mm. Like I lost mm. sleep in very very literal terms. I was like, this needs to be known. And she said, just wait till next week. It's going to be another expert. It's going to be Barry Schwartz. The next, a the next week is uh, Paolo Di Lazzaro, actually in opposite order. But in three weeks, I met three experts on the Shroud, wow. back to back to back. And yeah, it was, it was a privilege. This, um, and I was, meanwhile, like I said, studying theology. So I was every week learning tidbits about the faith from my teachers and then about the, the physicality and the mm. science of the Shroud from... Uh, chemists, from immunologists, from uh, there are different areas of shroud study. You know, it's kind of like an umbrella term that we use. Shroud study was like, what is that? What's not shroud study? It could be archaeology, it could be history, it could be, mm. you know, iconography. Okay. Um, but the science was something that I didn't hear. And I couldn't have described to you the physicality of the passion of Christ before I studied the shroud. But it it awakens. We're so used to seeing the crucifix on the wall. We hang it as jewelry from our necks, but we're, we're de desensitized to mm -hmm. its effects, right? Um, it's just too familiar. And the shroud shakes you out of that. And so it's a, it becomes the opportunity to share the gospel in, in a fresh new way. But my favorite thing to do is to share this kind of thing with people who aren't in the inside crowd. You know, like I've done this in, in Singapore, in Philippines, in um, Hong Kong. It's sometimes to lawyers or at like marinas or golf courses to non-Christians. That's the best. That's or young people. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm telling you, it's a tool for evangelization, but we have not always known how to use it in that way. A lot of the literature that kind of saturates uh, people's appetite for this is merely scientific. And so what we try to do at the Science of Faith Institute is bring that together. So can you take us one yeah. big step back? You bet. You were in seminary. This wasn't something that you had a great familiarity with. For somebody who's sitting here saying, what are we even talking about here? What yeah. is the shroud? Yeah. Yeah. So the shroud is purported to be the burial cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus after his crucifixion. And that was in contact with his body throughout Holy Saturday. And in the moment he rose on Easter Sunday, he rose out of that. <laughs> and so on this cloth, which is 14 feet wide and three foot seven um, 
tall, I suppose, it is, you have the imprint of a man. So you have blood stains, and then you see his, the front of his body, the part that wrapped over his face and stomach, and then it's so long that it wrapped around the back of his body, so you can see his whole scourged back, and um, you get all the details of this, the sufferings. In fact, he still holds the position as he had when he was in the vertical position. Even now, as he's lying flat, he's in rigor mortis, so the knees are still bent as they were on the cross. The head was hanging, and one was on the cross, and now it looks as if it's raised. There's no pillow underneath. If the mm. chin is close to the sternum, it's just because he's in this state of mm. cadaveric rigidity. It is unbelievable the amount of detail. I mean, just studying the morphology, the pathology of the body, one of the first things to be noticed about the shroud in the age now of modern science was that it was anatomically perfect. And so, so much so that even a agnostic by the name of Yves Delage wrote a paper, it, ha it was happy to conclude that this is Jesus of Nazareth. And this wasn't a believer. He's just saying, look, th th what this man suffered corresponds to the historicity we know about Jesus. And so he had no qualms in saying, that's him. And yet it wasn't, it wasn't even published in the minutes of the Académie des Sciences there at the turn of the 20th century because Jesus is a sign of contradiction. Like that same kind of scoop wow. that we're dealing with now, mm. it, was, it was back then too. And so the Shroud is this great controversy. It's this great debate. Scientists don't know how the image got there. So that's the interest from a scientific perspective. They want to dabble into these questions of what mechanism made it. Like, is it a painting? Is it a rubbing? Is it a scorch? Is it some sort of photograph? But it's not any of those. We've disproved that from a scientific point of view. Uh, what we don't know is what it is. <laughs> and so th that's, that's always a head scratcher. It's also a draw, you know, because when we don't know how to <laughs> explain things like UFOs or something like that, we, we just gravitate towards that and be like, come on. Well, fix it and explain it. It's that via negativa kind of thing where it's like, well, we've eliminated all of this, but there's still this mystery in front of us is what you're is what I'm hearing from you. It, that's right. Yeah, it is a mystery. And it's uh, sometimes people say it's um, inexplicable, but I like to I prefer to say it's it's unexplained. I think that's so mm -hmm. far we have mm -hmm. no um, no way of telling the mechanics of what brought it into being. There are two main theories that are still kind of on the table and um, that are like merely naturalistic means of the, the image formation. And one is that um, light uh, shined out of a cadaver. I'm not sure the last <laughs> time I, I saw a cadaver do that. But, uh, but th this is uh, honestly the theory. It's like some sort of cold radiation in a fraction of a second, like 40 billionths of a second, um, created these light effects mm. that left this imprint on the cloth. And then the other is that perhaps the body became mechanically transparent, you know, like light is transparent, it goes through things. Well, maybe the cloth collapsed into that space that the body once occupied. And when it did so, the image passed on to the cloth. Obviously, we can't reproduce either of those two theories in a laboratory, and so it kind of remains theoretical until somebody wants to volunteer and like die and rise again and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll do some comparative analysis at that point um, but for the time being it's um, let's just look at the qualities these enigmatic qualities of this image that are unlike anything else we uh, we, ha we know and try to make sense of it and for many people the best theory on the table is well what if this is the result of the resurrection what if it's the natural effect of a supernatural event, mm. uh, the resurrection itself, and if that's the case, then um, we're in a whole new, whole, whole new ball game here. Where is the actual shroud right now? It's in Torino, so four and a half <laughs> hours <laughs> north of Rome on the fast train. Um, so kind of like going towards France. There's some mountains between the Haute Savoie in southern France and the Savoy region. Um, which had its capital in Turin. And so that's where the cathedral, John the Baptist Cathedral. And so if you go towards the main altar and then a little nook, a little uh, small chapel to the left, uh, the shroud is in this double casing, an inert gas, constant temperature and pressure. Never, Obviously, we're trying sure. to preserve it for many generations to come. And it's clothed with this beautiful cloth that has in Latin the phrase, we venerate your shroud and we contemplate your passion. And, and that's, in a way, a little nugget about 
how the church deals with the shroud. Like we see it as it's venerable, and so we venerate the shroud. And as we, you know, come humbly in the spirit of veneration and devotion, what we're trying to do is contemplate the passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's an interior step that that's the part I love. That's the part I want I want to invite people to do. There's plenty of science, which is great, we need that. But I want to take that step and second step and help people see this as a mirror of the gospel so that they get to know the Jesus who lives <laughs> even better. Because Jesus on the cr on the shroud, if that's if that's him as I think it is, um, he, he's he's sleeping in death. But the Jesus we know and have received and live because of uh, sits at the right hand of the power in glory. I um okay so wow there's a lot there um that's so beautiful um one of the things that struck me as you were talking about this I love that statement of a a natural effect of a supernatural event mm -hmm. because I think there's so many times um we just attend church maybe out of habit which not, not bad that, that's a virtuous habit right but like we're just kind of going through the motions or something we think oh well these are nice stories that maybe have a good spiritual message right something to inspire me to do the right thing or to you know love my neighbor as myself all of that good stuff but we forget that no our lord became incarnate in a specific place and time and so there are going to be these artifacts mm -hmm. that surround his life and it's it's providence that's brought him to us but um, oh, yeah. but we have all of these these traces of of the gospel yeah, they're not fables. They're not. This is not mere fiction. A lot of people have that same kind of takeaway when they go to the Holy Land and they say, "My goodness, you know this spot that's mentioned here, there, and everywhere. It might have been, you know, Timbuktu or I don't know, uh, Never Never Land. Uh, mm -hmm. But wait a minute, I can go to Jerusalem and then from there go to uh, Bethesda the, or whatever, yeah. but, you know, and touch right. the place and see the. So what if? What about this? Think of this, John chapter twenty, the day that Mary Magdalene goes early in the morning to see the empty tomb, and there I'm doing scare quotes around uh, <laughs> uh, the empty tomb, because we use that terminology, and it does make sense insofar as the body that was supposed to be there isn't. But what I am fascinated to, to find there in that chapter is how full that tomb is. Yeah. And it's not this emptiness that is being described by the evangelist, but its contents, the, the, the linen cloths are there. And the pseudodium, the, the face cloth, is there. That's two witnesses, material artifacts, yeah. as you describe them. And they bear witness to an event that took place in history. It happened, you know. It reminds me, too, of, like, um, Pontius Pilate. Like, how did this guy's name get in the creed? Right. You, know, you, got, like, you got God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Mary, and then... The fifth is Pontius Pilate. Suffered <laughs> under Pontius Pilate. <laughs> right? We well, don't even mention Herod or like some of the other people who, who are, were there, and maybe even worse in a way than... But Herod. it's to your point about yeah. like, th this is a peg in history, yep. mm. right? That procurator was the one mm. who gave the juridical indictment to Jesus and put him to the cross, and this, this happened, and it's, uh, it, it's not indifferent to us if it did or didn't, you know, which right. I think some would be, you've heard this kind of, the Christ of faith, right, independent of the Jesus of history, as if you could divorce those things right. radically. That is still, we still see traces of that attitude mm. out there. Mm. And so I think the shroud flies in the face of that in a great way, mm. you know? It's just, this is there, what do you do with it? Okay, just look at it, now Now describe it. I, this happened to me in, uh, back in Easter, I was in New York. They were doing some Matt Damon movie, and the director was there. He's an atheist. He prides himself on being a man of science, this guy. And um, friendly enough, like, uh, he was, they warned me. They said, listen, he's going to, he kind of jumps in. He doesn't wait for you to um, finish your sentence, <laughs> let alone a paragraph if you had a, <laughs> an argument to, to kind of bring forth. But I was like, oh my gosh, do I need to, like, pray a novena before I go into this sure. uh, aggressive interview? And I'm waiting in the church, waiting for him to show up, and um we ended up having a three-hour interview about the shroud with a guy, and and they they said, mm. get ready just to speak, just kind of. I was waiting for him to cut me off and and to bring some objections. He was completely blindsided by the amount of evidence that there is, amount of the science that there is. He assumed, I, I kid you not, this was this is his words that it was going to be like a urine stain from a cow on a cloth that Christians creatively, oh, kind of looks like Jesus. He oh, was wow. on, it was just, he could not fathom 
that the shroud was the most studied archaeological mm. object in the history of the world, that we could talk physics and chemistry and x-ray and infrared and pollen samples and blood samples. And it, it, this was this was the kind of discourse that it wasn't prepared for and that I think we need to, as evangelists, in a world that uses science as a club mm. to say, don't believe because, look, this militates against your faith. Um, we're here. It's just the other way around. Here's the science that's prompting you almost to to believe. It's like giving you reasons to believe. I maintain the distinction between faith and reason like everybody else. But, man, is this stuff really provocative. Well, I love that, you know, oh, science, which has started by saying, well, we're going to limit ourselves to the strictly measurable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, now I can conclude that there are no unmeasurable things. Right. It's like, where is this scientism coming from? They're, yeah. they're, they're defeating themselves with that kind of staunch, um, uh, th it's kind of like this predetermined posture to use only that which is empirical, when that itself isn't an empirical, <laughs> uh, provable statement. Right. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a philosophical in. preconception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Presupposition. Wow. Mm, that's fascinating. You so, are... so science isn't uh, that kind of science. That's pseudoscience. Yeah. Is, isn't scientific enough. That's why it's it's a counterfeit. It's a, it's like science's evil twin sister. It's not really <laughs> science. There's but a Disney movie about that coming out later <laughs> this year. <laughs> Father, you've had a chance to have these conversations. You talk about atheists. You talk about people from different denominations, people that are purely coming at this from a historical standpoint. Can you talk about uh, some of the outcomes of people's exposure to the Shroud? I mean, we talk about yours just a little bit. Um, and yeah. kind of this, you, you go from already on this path to a, a moment of like losing sleep over yeah. there's more here. What are you seeing? What are you experiencing as you're traveling around or doing these talks in the reaction to people being able to see the images and hear about the photo negatives and the blood came for like you have so many cool scientific pieces to this. I kind of wish we could share them all. But what are you seeing in the emotional uh, faith, faith, faith filled responses? Well, listen, I'll tell you the one that I got from yesterday because this was fresh on my mind. But I was listening to a man who was atheist until he came into contact with the Shroud. And you wouldn't think, like, is, is that really possible? Like, can you read a book and then be so just mm. just challenged that you would go so far as to say, like, I'm going to try this prayer in Jesus thing out and see if he's on the other side of the conversation. That was this man's story. Wow. So his name is Larry Crowder. Um, he's Methodist, by the way. He has... He's, I feel like these are the great men who went before me and kind of, like, passed the baton, you yeah. know? These before so much of the modern science has come out, like we are so better situated now with all we know that it, it is so easy to, for me to just kind of like slide in and, and do it. <laughs> but these guys bore the brunt of it. You yeah. know what I mean? And, 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 but he converted through the shroud. This was, um, I, I want to say, I think it was six, 1969. He wow. picked me up from the airport. He was so eager to talk to me and just he, to see the good fruits of what's happening in my ministry. But I have to say, like, I, it reminds me of that gospel passage that others have gone before you, and now you're, like, picking the fruit that they, mm -hmm. they sowed. Is that the, ba the past participle? To sow? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they chucked the seeds, all right? All right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we're picking up the fruit. And that is absolutely the case. There is something so much bigger here. When I think of, like, the miracles, Jesus uses this expression, like, moving mountains. What is the biggest mountain to move, if not the human heart? Mm. And, and the miracle that I'm seeing everywhere is that people are coming to faith. People are coming into, into prayer. People are considering the nucleus of our faith, which is the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. What a privilege if we get to deliver that mail. Like, that is awesome. <laughs> so uh, I'll give you another example. There was a, a, a young girl from Spain. I think she was probably 18. She was kind of like the gadfly in her religious ed class, I guess, who's always having that sticky question and that the consecrated woman couldn't answer. I just learned what gadfly means, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, po poking and prodding. That, yes, yeah. exactly. And so she's, she says, the consecrated woman, to the girl in high school, look, we're here in Rome. This is a pontifical university. Why don't you ask your tough questions to some of the priest professors that are here? Get, and she was like, do you know what? I feel like after the presentation we had on the Shroud yesterday, I really just don't need to. Uh, and, and you know, so <laughs> you, never, awesome. you never know who is waiting for this kind of thing to kind of shore up the faith that's there, but in like mustard seed size. And it, needs to, it just needs to grow. 
Nick, tell them about when you were, I think, mowing the lawn or something, listening to the Pines with Aquinas that Father was on recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just doing some yard work and uh, listening to your episode from about a year ago um, with Matt Fred, and I just, I stopped and just started weeping as you went into detail about some of the, uh, you know, more, I guess, harrowing aspects of the passion and the physicality and the brutality mm. and yeah. the um, struggle to breathe, much less speak. I know. Um, I'd love to hear you go more on that. Just yeah. I know that's zooming way to no, the no, end, no. but Thank it's just such that. a no. it's such a powerful moment in history. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, no, I, I have to do this to myself, right? Because sometimes, you know, I share these things with others and I see in them th being stirred with emotion. And of course, I've been here a thousand times on the other side of the, and I need to be desensitized yeah. to the, that which has become familiar. And so, um, and we all do every single, look, we make the sign of the, the cross so casual. It's like, are we aware of, of what that cross was? Do you know in the first centuries, they couldn't even draw the cross. It was so scandalous. They could, there were no depictions in the first century of Jesus on the cross. Now we parade it, you know, triumphantly, uh, pr proudly. Um, but it was the most ignominious thing you could possibly suffer. And um, when you get into the physicality of the shroud, you're going to see all the more why. The, one little detail, just, I know this is, uh, this is the kind of thing that, that really shook me out of it. The scourge wounds are just as deep in the pelvic region as everywhere else in the bo uh, on the body. There was no protective loincloth. He was utterly naked. When, when that hit me, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, not only the pain of being scourged with, like, these lead balls are make the equivalent of a third-degree burn as far as the damage that it does to the body. And they're in the pelvic region. And, I mean, like... What what do I do with that? You know, it's like, it, is it just like, ouch? Is that the is that the effect we're meant to? It, it, you know, I think there's something profound there, and I'm not going to pretend to have an exhaustive answer to this, but I know that Pope Saint John Paul II talks about the original nakedness of Adam and Eve, right? Mm -hmm. How they were naked without shame, and it seems just deeply profound that the shame of nakedness comes with sin. And here is Jesus untying the knot that Adam and Eve tied with their disobedience, but with his loving surrender to the Father, he's untying that knot, but not from a distance, not with like from with a magic word or something, not with like a, a snap of the finger or like a wave of the wand. He's he's stepping into the effects, the full effects, the last consequences of our sins, and then uh, redeeming our suffering and. Um, if it, if it means him being shamed in that way, like I know what it would be for me to be to be put on display in any in any remote way close to that, I would be absolutely mortified. Mm. And um, and so there's a level of um, torture here that goes beyond the physical element. But mm. um, you're right that that that's profound too. Like you talked about the the breathing. I was just having this uh, debate because do you know. Everything on the shroud in the science is up for, you know, discourse and back and forth. Uh, there's a certain French surgeon by the name of Pierre Barbet who studies in the 1930s, I believe he publishes in the, in the 50s, this A Doctor at Calvary. You might have seen this like 18 different languages, this book. It's, yeah. it's fascinating. Um, but he gets into the physicality of breathing. You know, so like when we breathe, like profoundly, in, like inhale, you, you kind of like raise your chest, your rib cage expands. When you exhale, that collapses, which is like easy to do when your muscles are, when your arms are low, because those intercostal muscles relax. But when you don't have the freedom to move your arms as you wish, because somebody pinned them high, like with nails onto a, a, a cross, all you can do is the next best thing, which is to press down in the nail in your feet, pull and twist on nails that are going through the metacarpals, where there's the ulnar nerve and the median nerve that pass there, and and, and you have to twist. Like, we have a bifurcation pattern in the, in the wrist that means that he's, he's not just staying still and just, like, rising straight up, but a square cross-section of this nail is now grating against mm. that. Area. We have, in World War II, there were soldiers that didn't have morphine when their median nerve was exposed 
and preferred to commit suicide than, than to endure this pain. And, and Christ is there for, what, four and a half hours breathing in this way? And we know this because all the blood that's trickled down the forearm is like, uh, likewise um, dividing again and again. Mm. He's, it seems he's in an inferior position, and he's in uh, uh, then a higher position, up and down, up and down, and this just to breathe. For me, the, the point that really is driven home is the words then that he speaks. It's like, if that's what it takes to, to utter a breath, like just to get air out, mm. what is it to pray? I mean, I can't, if I have a toothache or like a splinter, I, I can't pray. <laughs> okay, that's what a lightweight I am. But I mean, y- Jesus is, is praying, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. He's, he's actually providing excuse for us in the moment of his agonies as we're torturing him. And, I mean, it just gives a whole new insight into the heart of Christ, the love of Christ, what drives him, that he should be speaking to his Father in this way. Father, And, and I love this little detail. Uh, in the Greek, it says, he was saying, Father, forgive them. Not, not he said mm-hmm. in like a one-time thing, but maybe that was a refrain that he came back to again and again, Father, forgive them. Um, up and down. I mean, that, that is a, a pain. It's so unique, it gets his own word. We, we talk about this flippantly in English, like excruciating pain. We never pause to think about that. That comes from ex crux is the word the cross. Mm. Cruciatus is the one put to the cross. Mm. So it was engineered to be this sumum supplicium, the worst of all punishments. This, it's, a, it's a pain machine. That's what, the, that's what the cross is. And Christ steps into that willingly. Like he didn't, nobody takes my life from me, says Jesus. I lay it down of my own accord. I've got the power to lay it down, the power to take it up again. And so, man, we need this message, don't we? Especially men, I want to say. This is what got me into the vocation. When somebody, when a priest conveyed to me Jesus' manliness, Jesus' courage, Jesus' fortitude, the love that he was manifesting on the cross, that's what drew my heart to consider the priesthood. I remember to this day, I didn't connect the dots later on in life with the shroud. I was really like, oh my gosh, this is bringing me back to that which really called me. Hmm. But we, have, we, we, are, we are called to heroism, and we're proposing for people, you know, pleasure and leisure. And Christ is calling us to take up our cross and follow him. And, and, and this is something worthy. This is something noble. But if we don't contemplate it, we'll never know who he is and who we are in light of him. Father, I'm... Glad we didn't do this 20 years ago because I love my wife and kids, but I'm pretty sure I would have <laughs> become a priest <laughs> if I did this. Uh, I don't have much to say besides like this this connection of you know the first time you ever watch Passions of the Christ, Passion of the Christ, and you're you're moved by the brutality and your heart aches for Jesus. You know that's an actor. You know that was a film makeup. You know all those right. things. Not that it was easy for them to do it, but I'm just saying like you know what that is. Mm-hmm. And then your description of uh, experiencing the shroud and what you're even giving to us and to every listener right now is some much more meaningful version of that same feeling. And it's it's not even a feeling of guilt that I think is really easy to have the first time you see the passion. It's a feeling of like complete and utter like uh, appreciation. Um, like unworthiness. Unworthiness. Yeah. 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 I'm crying. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, that's, listen, it's worthy of that. Like, I think we need to break down our, you know, hard heartedness, the shells, the callousness around our heart. And that's what uh, the, the shroud helps us do, just to realize, Lord, what is my sin that I should have disfigured your face in this way? Like, I, I, I got to be wake in, uh, like, when I go to confession, this is what I think about, you know, right? Judas kissed the face of Jesus in such a way that, look, he was one of the 12. He he was called. He was part of the inner circle. Like, that's me. I, I have actually more because I've received the Eucharist so many times. I received you know, ordination. I received mm. a thousand things. Um, and I received God's mercy a thousand times over. And and so my, my, my sins are not just infractions of a rule, but it's like this is my, this is my best friend. This is my Savior. This is my God. This is the one who went into the depths of hell to save me and that I should be indifferent to that. Like, no, like every fiber of my being wants to say no to that. Right. But we got to, um, I think we got to 
come face to face with that. And like Jesus would say, it's like when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And and there's something magnetizing about the love of Christ on the cross. Like we don't, there's something beautiful about him there, even in in the pain of it all, even in the bloodshed of it all. Like there's something that we realize that there's there this is this is true virtue. This is this is worth celebrating. Like we use that language, don't we? In the the celebration of the passion. Like what kind of party <laughs> is this? Like no, but but in the deepest sense of like what all that is good and true and beautiful like and that and it doesn't terminate in in death but Jesus passes through the cross into new glorified state like that but now we got to look back to that and the, i i know part of me wants to race from good friday and just boom easter sunday isn't it r- strange <laughs> that we have like holy saturday to deal with it's like it, that space that's uncomfortable that we have to contemplate in silence what we've done and what it means, and to sit with that. Plus, it gives us time to sell, to prepare for the Easter Vigil, which is also has its you know a lot of jobs to do for the <laughs> ones who make the flowers and set the table and all that kind of stuff. But there's a there is something profound about that that Jesus entered into death. That for me, this is the this is the point. Like there is no space, there is no trauma, there's no loneliness, there's no suffering that Jesus can't reach me at because he went all the way down. And, and, and mm. from there brought victory. And so when, when things are bad, when things are, when they think something seems insurmountable, like we can remember that Jesus descended all the way down and that's where, that's where he can rescue me from too. I'm still recovering. <laughs> over here. Um, yeah. I've actually stopped crying. So I'm back. I'm back completely here. Um, you say things like w- what we are doing, and you talked about an institute. Is this your job? Not exactly, okay. but uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of a, it's been a side job, but it's becoming more and more um, significant. All right, so well, you know, you came on the Beatitudes, so watch out for th- what's going to happen. This next. is this is the milestone. <laughs> Red letter pad. day. We we call it the Beatitudes bump. It's, you know, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> well, no, seriously, if I can, for those who are listening and uh, think this is worthy of sharing, we need people to get more serious about this. So for those, especially if you have any theological background, if you're a catechist, if you're a spiritual person who loves to share the faith, if you can learn just a little bit more about the Shroud from history, from science, whatever that aspect that kind of like, like calls to you, and then share that together with your faith, boom, that is a powerful mm-hmm. combination in today's world. We, we have dumbed down our discourse, and we think that catechesis means more pizza and ping pong or something. But I'm telling you, there's a role for those who can um, deliver also um, a message that is credible on, on, in terms that today, the t- today's world is looking for. Okay, so that on the one hand. If you want to go deep, there is a postgraduate certificate in Shroud Studies. Whoa. So you can study uh, after college a whole year. Um, at a pontifical university, it's called Regina Apostolorum, and that's where I do teach. So I teach theology, I teach biblical languages and synoptic gospels. But they kind of roped me in to also teach this shroud, shroud stuff, but I teach the biblical theology of the Passion together with like physicists who do their physics things and, and chemists and archaeologists and things. But I give a little window there so that we can kind of give you a panoramic view of, of Shroud studies in the course of a year. We just repackaged that in Italian to d- to do it for just one semester, mm. and boom! This 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 semester, two hundred and thirty people signed up for that. Awesome! And and so I want to do that next year in English and repackage for the sake of just disseminating this further. We also have yeah. these Othonia museums that, just like at our university, you can visit and see a life size reproduction of the shroud. The, a statue that shows the three-dimensionality of the body as it lay in the tomb, the instruments of torture, the lance, the, the um, flagrum, the Roman whip, um, the crown of thorns, a reproduction of the first century tomb, a didactic museum so you can understand. We have 15 in the world. I wish I could put like two more zeros after that. Mm-hmm. So um, what I'm trying to work with and we're, we're creating a team is so that we can make that r- reproduced easily enough that it can go in lots of parishes, lots of college centers all over the world. Um, so we're working on that. Actually, in someone in California right now is working on the aesthetics of it so that we can have lively animations. 
there's a lot is happening with with the shroud but it's it's been like i said it's been a side job but it's becoming more and more just it's so fruitful i can't in good faith leave it to mm. the side so much. Well, this is like why I want things like virtual reality to exist <laughs> in every house. Like, let's go experience the shroud, Yeah, you know, and then you know, be drawn in that way. So, somebody in Singapore had that idea, actually. They, they came and scanned a museum and are touring with that idea. I don't know what's going to come of it. A lot of it is just people's generosity. Like, this yeah. stuff costs money. We, ha we have had a shoestring budget for years. And listen, I love doing... God works in those ways with those those little talks. It prepped me for that Matt Fred video that you talked about early on. Uh, yeah. Uh, was it Pints with Aquinas? And then one day he invites me in, and boom! I think a hundred and what what is it? One point five million. Yeah. I, I think I've seen it now. Yeah. And so that is that's remarkable to think about the power of podcasting, the power of technology to share that. So. I pray that you guys serve as a blessing in, in that same way. You know, uh, who knows what guests that you will have on your show that will reach the ends of the earth. And somebody, look, I gave a talk in Hong Kong. I don't even remember this person. I don't remember this happening. Then years later, I show up at an event, a, a movie in, in Rome, and this gentleman comes up to me and said, you gave this talk. Um, he's now a seminarian. Mm. And I was like, I, I don't even, I have no in recollection of what he, sure. what I said or but that's the Holy Spirit, and yeah. that's the power of uh, our words. When we're faithful and we give ourselves over to him, look, I love what he says. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Mm -hmm. That's St. Paul's. That's, that's our confidence. Because right? it's not, it, it, the world doesn't need Andrew, but what about Christ in and through Andrew? Like, that's something that, that's powerful. Father, two questions for you. One is... Um, Somebody's hearing this right now, and they are feeling generous. They are feeling called. They are feeling the need to participate. Where would you direct them so that they can get involved, whether that's financial or with more than financial? Yeah, so uh, with the Shroud Studies, check out othoniainternational.org. That is our non-for-profit, and that's where you can sign up for postgraduate certificate in Shroud Studies. It's hard to spell, so let me let me write that out. <coughs> this is just the word for the burial cloths in Greek, othonia. Oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> O-T-H, <laughs> O-T-H-O-N-I-A, international.org. And then also for those who want to help out with these museums, like uh, this is no small chunk of change that we're trying to raise, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I trust in God to do it. Um, but we're looking, we have a foundation at our university, and we can earmark that money for Othonia, that is for this shroud apostolate. Um, and so you would go to upra.org. This is the website for Regina Apostolorum, a pontifical university in Rome. And just go to donate, and I think you can even click other and then write in Othonia or Father Andrew, and they will be allocated. All non for profit. It's not for me. I don't have a personal bank account. It's all for these museums and for just disseminating work on the Shroud. Well, and I, uh, that kind of led to the question I was going to ask about going deeper for people that are just looking for resources. So, mm. my next question then would be <laughs> with all of this work, are you finding this to be ecumenical? I mean, you talk about oh, yeah. your Methodist buddy and this person picking you up from even the studio later. Right. You know, yes. You got a Roman collar on, and there's all these different people around Dallas carting you around that have I'm nothing to do with the Catholic Church. So I'm curious to hear that participation. Yeah, the shroud is this secret weapon for that. Like, it's true. I'm not used to having mega churches invite me to speak about the gospel. But when it's talking about the shroud, all of a sudden, that's exactly what's happening. Yep. I was at a golf course um, event. I was like, I, so I, this is a funny story. There's a patrons of the Vatican Museums. And this guy just got s excited about the shroud. He said, give me three weeks. I will bring you each day to a different venue. I was like, okay. It's kind of like the CEO mentality. I love businessmen. I love that kind of entrepreneurial spirit. I love when they combine with the church. That mm. That's a power, a, a powerhouse, when lay people and consecrated get together. And so this man did everything. He, I mean, with his team, said, you're going to speak here at J.P. Morgan on the 29th floor. It was it, There wasn't a single Catholic in the crowd, I don't think. It was fascinating. They loved it. We went to a marina. I did the same. There was a, this pastor from a mega church. I want to say this is Singapore. Yeah. And he invited me to say, come back next time and we'll do it uh, at, in, in the church. And I, I was just not used to this. Unfortunately, COVID canceled that event. Sure. So I, I never got to do that. But this is not our personal property as Catholics. Look, 
everybody who believes in the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus ought to be interested in the shroud. Yeah. Yeah. And this is changing. This is changing. Look, right at um, as we speak, a new documentary is coming out, God willing, um, but it's called The Shroud Face to Face, and Robert Orlando is making that. He's at a Princeton. And he, what I love about this new documentary is that he interviews five top-tier theologians in the world of Protestantism. So you have Dale Allison at Princeton. You have Mark Goodacre at, uh, at Duke. You have Craig... Um, Oh, gosh, I just lost his last name. I was literally uh, going to brag on all the names you know. So <laughs> yeah. You just showed your humanity. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but these are these are big boys, okay? Uh, yeah. And Ben Witherington III is a Methodist, and they're weighing in on the shroud. And this is not a typical thing that you see. Look, yeah. I go to the Society of Biblical Literature every year now for the past seven years. Nobody talks about the shroud. They talk serious topics, exegesis. And the shroud is sidelined. But I think that's beginning to change. Mm. Because for that. Yeah, because you know a lot of people just assumed that it was debunked, and now the, the debunkers themselves have been debunked in a way. And so the, the shroud is fair game again in the way it hasn't been in the last 20 years. And that means that there's, there's time to, um, this is a great opportunity to, to share. Well, maybe that brings us to a topic to kind of get close to the end of this one uh, before our bonus show, which come back for the bonus show. We haven't recorded it yet, but it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and also real <laughs> real quick, if if you're enjoying this, please subscribe, share, uh, forward the link to a friend or family member that you think would really uh, eat up all of this stuff. Because, I mean, this is this is a feast right here. And we're already big in Australia, so we could use some other places. too. <laughs> Uh, the question you talked about debunking the the debunkers, which gosh, I could write that book. That sounds like fun. But um, you, there's all this stuff that came out, and I forget what year that kind of talked about this one corner of the shroud and how it wasn't as old, and you, like some debunking stuff. What stops us from moving forward with a concerted effort, with all the science, with all the abilities now, to to concretely debunk the debunkers? And and you know, it sounds like we're on this path. But it seems like there's all this tools and ability right at our fingertips. Like, what is the gate or the obstacle that maybe it's supernatural, maybe it's it's political. I don't know. But what stops us from going through that process with the power of the shroud? Well, I think you're suggesting like what what stops us from doing further testing yes, on the shroud to yeah, yeah anything to like, like that. further authenticate. I the don't shroud? really want to rip it up, so I'm not advocating for anything. I'm just yeah. saying like what stops us. Right. Well, I think just humanly speaking, it's easily understandable that after the fiasco of 1988, that was frankly just embarrassing, like front page news, um, the shroud is proven to be a fake. Oh, it's medieval. And the church has been kind of promoting this thing. And um, now you're going to have to like cry in the corner and, you know, repent of your Christianity because mm. you it, w it was so absurd and so exaggerated. But um, at the same time, it it was a felt effect, yeah. and it w for 19 years, it, it basically silenced shroud studies. Even those who were the serious scientists, they were marginalized, and mm. their their literature was not taken seriously. It was enough to just say, look, we've proved it to be medieval. End of story. Case closed. And um, so th I think the fear of repeating uh, mm. something embarrassing is an obstacle, but also just, look, you got to jump through a lot of bureaucracy and hoops to do anything with the shroud. The church is famous for this. I mean, look, I can't even reserve mass at St. Peter's without um, asking, going through all these protocols, uh, it, right? Not to mention what it is to visit uh, Dallas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, we experienced that right. one. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you know what the, the church is like in this respect. But I think in this particular case, we shouldn't be held back by fear. What I want to say is I'm all for testing the shroud again, and I think one day we'll see it. What it what, will... What will it take to get there? I think it's going to take this. The international community, when you have con a consensus from the, uh, the scholarly field, like when you have a, sh a center of shroud study in Poland and in Turin and in Rome and in Valencia in Spain, and they're all kind of saying together, Holy Father, this would be a, a, a wise way of proceeding. Mm -hmm. And then he can just sign off with his authority and say, by all means, you know, you know go keep going. Avanti. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Andiamo avanti. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and that could happen, and maybe I'll live to see it. I kind of hope so. But what I want to say is let's not wait for that yeah. because we're in, a, we're in a place right now, we're in a very good place to share on the shroud, and we have been far too cautious, to my mind, and, uh, and quiet. And I, I want to say let's make some noise a little bit yeah. about this right now because we, with what we have, 
there's already a compelling case to present Christ with a shroud, and I think we should seize that opportunity while we've got it. Let's do it. Wow. All right, you heard it, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, let's seize the opportunity to go deeper in our shroud knowledge. Our, uh, you have all these cool terminologies that I'm going to have to go back and look <laughs> yeah. up our, our shroud. Of we'll, lo- s- we'll put a lot of links in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can uh, download it from the shroud. <laughs> <laughs> too too far was that a stretch okay sorry i, I listen there's <laughs> going to be more of that to come on the bonus show that's my teaser to stick around um father andrew dalton we're going to ask you uh to finish this show differently than we finish any other show we're going to have you do just a a prayerful blessing over everything that we've talked about and then we'll conclude but i just have to thank you on behalf of all of us on behalf of Amen. the vatican valley here in north texas for visiting and uh sharing all of your shroud work Actually, at the school where your brother priests are, I was there on Sunday for their feast, and they had um, some of the images up, and I just sat there with one of my kids that was crying during Mass. I just sat there face-to-face with the kind of the light-up image of the shroud. So excited to be able to sit here and talk with you and to gain from this wisdom, and then you made me cry. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank Let's you. pray. Let's yeah, do it. This, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. And we thank you especially for going all the way into the depths of God forsakenness, all the way into the darkness of death in order to show your love for us. And Lord, we're sorry for all the ways that we've hurt you. Um, We don't ever want to disfigure your beautiful face. And we want to contemplate it because that's what we're made for. Now we see dimly as in a mirror. Uh, One day we'll see you face to face. We won't see you sleeping in death. We'll see those eyes open. We'll see that face smile upon us. And that's what we're made for. And we long for that beatific vision. And so, Lord, as we live in this realm of beatitude, because grace has already begun and glory is what waits us, we, we contemplate as, as we walk, as we walk towards our heavenly home. And we ask that you bless our journey. Help us to courageously carry our cross, to not be afraid of the pains that are involved, because we know that there are so many birth pangs of your life being brought into this world. And so courageously, joyfully, we carry it as we, as we march towards you. And we thank you. We bless you. We ask your blessing upon the Beatitudes and all who listen. We ask that you prosper the work of our hands, Lord. Um, God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. We will be seeing you on the bonus show, and for the rest of you, we will see see you in the Eucharist. God bless. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to join us at our undersized table, subscribe to the video version of the show on YouTube by typing at, that's the symbol at, so shift and two on your keyboard, at the underscore Beatitudes on YouTube. We'll see you there. This podcast is part of the Spoke Street Network. For more great podcasts, visit Spokestreet.com.